took our lenses out to the studio, but the agenda remains the same, tracking the progress and the development of Ghanaian athletes around the world. Philadelphia Union's David Akam has opened his doors to us and we will be interacting with him on what his season has been like and what indeed his journey as a professional has revealed. David, it's nice to have you on the tracker. Thank you very much for having me. Let's, let's begin by talking about your early childhood. For those who don't know you at all, where did you grow up? Who's your mother? What friends did you have? What influenced you as a child? Uh, I grew up in Inuma, a suburb in, in Accra. Mm. And everyone, mostly, Inuma is a fishing community. Yeah. And every, everything you do is, is all about trying, trying to survive in Inuma. Mm. And, but I was fortunate enough to, to go to one of the best schools in, in Tema. Because I think my, uh, my parents wanted me to have like a good education. So I went yeah. to Sakmono School Complex. Mm. I had a good education before uh, joining, joining Right to Dream as, as a kid. Mm. Now, even before we get to your <coughs> career at the academy, um, where were you first discovered? What was the first pitch that you played on? Where did you and your friends enjoy football first? Uh, as a kid, it, it was all about having fun. Yeah. There, there was nothing about uh, professional contracts or being yeah. a professional footballer. Yeah. It was all about having fun. Any, any chance we get, we, tr we try to have fun, play, play football, because mm -hmm. that's, that's what we, we, know, we know how to do. And also, it's a way of getting, getting out of certain troubles. Yeah. It's all about playing football and having fun with friends. And it's also about playing uh, on the f any, any place we get. We don't even have a foot. Mm. Any place, any small part we get, that's where we play. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, if you didn't go on to become a professional footballer, what other career path could you possibly have chosen? Uh, at the moment, I, I still have my degree in sports science and I'm trying to continue to have my master's. So mm. uh, I'm okay at school. I'm not, example, I won't say, I'm not like the typical Ghanaian footballer. Yeah. But, uh, I, I try to take my education serious, so, mm. and I love sports, so I don't know, I, I might be working in the sports yeah. industry, whether uh, uh, management, administrator, I don't know, yeah. but I love sports, so. You definitely would have been in this industry. In the, in the sports industry, hmm. whether, f it doesn't, whether football, athletes, yeah. athletics, or anything, I don't know, but I, I would definitely be in the sports industry. Now let's talk about your journey to Ride to Dream. I, I was a Ride to Dream, I think four years ago, I had a tour of the facility and I spoke to um, one of the scouts out there, Joe Mulberry. And he was telling me that I see a lot of kids having fun and it looks like the academy is the dream life, but it's extremely difficult to get into a place like Right to Dream. How did you manage to breach this particular quality barrier to become one of the chosen few who actually honed their skills at this prestigious academy? Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Right to Dream is one of the biggest academy in Ghana, and they have invested a lot of money into yeah. uh, their training field, facilities, education complex. So you, you can imagine that a lot of people want to be there, and yeah. it's, it's all about the, the whole Ghana people. There, there's a lot of players in Ghana, and everyone wants to be noted to play for Right to Dream. So it wasn't easy, it was a long journey, and and we tried, we had a lot of trials, different places, and, and I think my, my quality stand out because uh, I'm a skillful and fast player, so I think that, that stood out for the, uh, for the scouts and, and I got selected. Mm. What quality did you take out of the academy? Because I've realized that even in my interactions with athletes, the athletes who come out of the academy live a different life. They sound different from those who perhaps have played in the coach teams and have come through the coach system. What are some of the qualities and some of the things you have thought that make academy players stand out? Yeah, I, I played coach as a kid. So you did play coach Yeah, too. I, I played coach, so yeah. I, I know both lives. And I think the difference is academy doesn't only focus on, on football. Yeah. It focuses on both education and, and football. Yeah. So uh, you learn so much in life also, not, yeah. not only on the field. So... I think that that's the main difference. That's mm. the main difference. You, you can't only be just just a footballer. You, you yeah. need to be good at both. Yeah. 
Now, tell us about when you first got your offer to go to Europe. I know that it was sort of <coughs> through education. Yeah. Um, just walk us through the steps. When you first received the news that you had gotten a chance to perhaps go and continue your degree and then you'd have a chance to maybe play football? Yeah. Personally, I, I think I took, I took the, the long uh, road, road yeah. to, to become a pro professional soccer player and, and attempt I turned a professional footballer at the age of 21, and yeah. that's, that's not typical for other footballers. Yeah. Some people turn 17, 18, yeah. but uh, I'm so proud of all the road I took because uh, I got the chance to, to further my education, uh, met so many people, and, yeah. and I learned so much in life also. So uh, I'm always proud of the, of the road I took, and, and having the education in my, in my, uh, as part of as part of me is, is something that I will always cherish. Hmm. Now, is that when the first deal to go play or sign a professional contract came? When you were in school? Yeah, I, w I was in school. I was, I was playing uh, in the university games, hmm. colleges. and Where was this? I was in England. Okay. I was in England. I went to Harvard College. I was there playing. And one of the coaches in, in Sweden hmm. called me and told me, hey, he, has seen me, he has watched me play many times and, and he wants me to... To, to come to Sweden and play for him, no yeah. trials. Yeah. And his Grand Porter, he's now the coach oh, for Swansea. Yeah. He, he told me, I, I've seen you play, I know the qualities you have, so uh, I would love to have you. This is a two years contract. If any time you want, you can sign. What was that for you like? Did you have to talk it over with your parents, with your agent? Did you make a decision there and then? I didn't have agents. My, and my parents didn't know nothing about football. <laughs> for me, I didn't, I didn't even think about just yeah that's why I just just give me the pen <laughs> <laughs> just give me the pen I didn't even now nah, I read a little bit but the money you were excited I was excited the money wasn't wasn't anything a, anything for me it yeah. was just about getting the opportunity to play and also show to people what I can do and that was they were they were in Division One at that time and I just signed a contract and straight I moved to Sweden. You talk about moving to Sweden. What, what was the difficult part about? Settling into the Swedish culture? Uh, I think language and, and the weather. Mm. Even though I stayed in, in England for about yeah. four, four years, but it was still different compared to Sweden. They, mm. In England, we, we, Ghana, we speak English and yeah. England in English, so it was easy to yeah. uh, settle in. But Sweden, they, they speak Swedish and, and the weather was really cold compared to England. So, mm. but, but I had like really good teammates and, and and the club really helped me to settle in well. Mm. Talking about the club helping you to settle in, what do they usually <coughs> do for a player like you? Would they say, get you a translator or a teacher to teach you the language, or they try to maybe rent a house for you so you don't feel lonely? What does it involve with regards to the club helping a player to settle down? Like, they did everything. They, uh, they gave me someone to, to, to drive around. Mm. Uh, he... he uh, look for apartments mm. and he showed me every everywhere like anything I want he will be there mm. anytime any he will be there trying to help me and and th this these are the kind of uh, things club do that they help players that they, mm. they have people around that are always available for you to, to use mm. now walk us through your first <coughs> moment putting on your jersey professionally stepping onto the pitch the first time what was it like for you uh, it was fun, but personally, I, I just wanted to have fun on the mm. field, and that as a kid, that's that's the main thing, and I yeah. think that's that's the main thing that keeps keeps me going. Yeah. I just want to have fun on the field, and and it, it makes you happy. You just want to have fun, and because yeah. if you don't, then you start putting more pressure on yourself. Yeah. But also, when I went, there, I wanted to prove myself that I'm good enough, and and I want to to progress to the next stage. So. I, th there was a bit of pressure on me, but mm -hmm. also I just wanted to have fun. At this point, you know a bit about Swedish life and what football in Sweden is like. But how different was the move from Ostersand to Helsingborg? Because that's where you really started gaining recognition. Yeah, it, it was a big challenge because I, I was playing in Division 1 and Helsingborg was in the top league. They won the league before and they were, they were playing the Champions League. So... Uh, I got a call from the director that they are really interested in me and they want to sign me and and 
I think I had other offers from Sweden as well, but yeah. I think they, they were the top team at that time. So I wanted to be playing the top team. So yeah. I chose to go to Helsingborg and, and and the challenge wasn't easy, especially in the first first year. I got there, they, they already have their plans. Yeah. They already have like other big players in my yeah. position. So I just I just have to be patient and and hopefully get get my chance. Hmm. Now I remember at a point in your housing board career you were scoring just about every other week. What what happened then? Is it that you had playing partners that you had great chemistry with or your confidence was just up at that point? Yeah, I think we we were playing in a system that really suits me and and I think the the system was built around me and, mm. and the coach always talk to me and the stuff like stuff that I need to do to, yeah. to, to flourish in the system. So uh, it was all about the system and the players around me. They, everyone was playing for me. So I was just happy and enjoying my football. Hmm. So at that point, had you received offers from Europe? Were you clear in your mind where you wanted to move on to after leaving Sweden? Uh, I wasn't really clear about where I was going, but I wanted to leave Sweden. Mm. Why year. it was too cold there? It wasn't too cold. I think uh, I've done my best there. I've played three years. I've done everything, and it was time for another challenge. And mm. and the, the team knew I wanted another another challenge, so yeah. they were they were happy for me to leave at the end of the season. But also, I was I was just waiting for for the perfect move or perfect place to be. Talking about the perfect move. Before you moved, you know, as journalists, we are snooping around for information. We are looking, digging up. I had news that you were going to Portugal. I had news that you were possibly going to Spain, that you were possibly going to Holland. And then you landed in America. That was shocking for everybody. But how perfect was the move to America for you to have ignored all the other offers? Uh, <laughs> I would say I was, I was even shocked when, when I got a uh, offers from America because first I wanted to stay in Europe and, and be okay. playing Champions League. And so your mindset was that after Sweden you was you're going stay to stay in Europe, Europe, like by in a bigger league, yeah. like playing Champions League, Europa League. And but the move I was expecting didn't really yeah. come at that time. And mm. and the offers I had was from from China, Belgium, and and um, China, Belgium, America, and Mexico. And mm. those. I think I got those offers in, in December. Yeah. And the club too wanted uh, wanted to, to have their plans for the next season. So mm -hmm. they wanted me, they knew I was leaving, so they wanted everything to be done yeah. for me, for them to, to also know their plans for the future. So so th those were the offers I had at that time and I have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy, it was one of the difficult decisions I've made. But also, I, I would say it was, I was still in a good position yeah. because having all these four offers from all these countries was, was, was a good thing. So uh, I think, I would say the move to MLS was, was the perfect move, but I would say the respect and the confidence I had from, from Chicago Fire was, was the main reason why I chose to go there. Hmm. Talk about respect and um, the interest they showed in you. Your last days with fire were not necessarily as heartwarming as you'd have wanted it to be walk us through your last days with fire and why you were eventually traded they didn't have anything to do with the all-star snub and your little skirmish with your coach at the time uh i, I learned so much in chicago and i learned f football is all about business and club they, everything is about the club, what, mm. what they want to gain from you. And I think personally, they, they thought uh, they could get more money or more like, uh, I don't know, more money because if they trade me, that's, that's, that's the best for them. Yeah. And also, I, I wanted to go to Europe and I had offers mm -hmm. in Germany, France, but they didn't want me to leave. Mm. And I think that was, that was the main reason everything came about. Hmm. with all the unnecessary stuff that happened during yeah. the season but that's that's my dream i wanted they, they knew it before i came i came to chicago i told them i wanted to come to chicago play two three years then move move back to europe and they knew it and they they said yeah they'll help me to do that but at the end of the day is their decision hmm. they, they didn't want me to leave and they wanted to trade me 
but also the, the way I was traded wasn't the best because I, I told them I've played three and a half years for the club, I've done yeah. everything for the club and on the blind side I got traded without even me knowing. I was just about to ask you about that. I mean, how do these trades happen? So you are at home and you get a call that we have dealt you to another team. Is that how it happens? Yeah, that, that's what happened. That's how it does. But my, I didn't know. I saw it online. Wow. I, you I literally have, saw that you had been yeah, traded online. Yeah. I got people testing me. What? Well, are you going to Philadelphia? And that was, I think I flew back to Chicago yeah. straight from Ghana. So I was home. I haven't even changed. And I got people texting me. What? Well, where are you going? What happened? I was like, and I checked online and I saw that I've been traded. And what was that for you? I, I felt bad. I felt bad because I've, I've done everything for this club yeah. and I got traded on the blind side. At least a little bit of respect will be good, like phone call. But it came later, but it was too late though. I told them, hey, it, it's too late. At least show some respect. Mm. But they didn't. But I learned so much because it's football. It's, it's business. Yeah. People, club do whatever that they, th they think is right for them. And yeah. it's business. So I accept it. Hmm. Now, I remember that when the news officially went mainstream, Philadelphia Union fans were in over their heads that they were going to get David Akam. They literally came to meet you at the airport. They brought you flowers. What was it like embracing a new city, a new challenge, instead of going to Europe? You were like, I'm still stuck in America. What was that like? Uh, mentally, it was tough because I wasn't prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for that, but... When I got there, the, the way they showed me love, the fans, the yeah. club, I think they, they treated me really well and they showed me so much love. So I was like, I have to accept that this is my place, this is my home now. So mm. uh, I have to start playing and, and trying to give something to the fans. Now, I expected that you were going to hit the ground running and perhaps since you had been in America for a while, the Philadelphia experience was going to be more smoother or smoother than the Chicago Fire experience but it turned out that your opening months were a little rocky what, what, what was all that about you were not getting as much playing time as you expected you were not scoring as much yeah it, it was tough I was I was coming back from surgery and and I went there so I wasn't 100% fit yeah and I tried to play through all this injury but it didn't work out then later I have to see a specialist and yeah. And I have to do another surgery. So for me, I don't want to blame everything on the injury. Mm -hmm. it, it was just, it just didn't happen for me there. I, I did everything. I worked hard, but it just didn't happen. And and also I had the injury, so it made yeah. it made everything worse. But it's it's part of the game. As as a footballer, I, sometimes you you face all these challenges. Yeah. You have a difficult season, and I think la this this year or last year, yeah. this year is, this year was. One of my worst like season in my career, and I just have to accept accept mm -hmm. that it didn't work well and, mm -hmm. and, and move on. Hmm. Now, when you get injured as a player, um, a lot of times there are players who eventually veer away from their stipulated diet. They move away from certain lifestyle practices. How have you managed to keep your head in the game during your time in injury? Do you spend time with family? What do you do to keep you occupied during this injured period? When, when you are injured, it's, it's the toughest thing to, to happen to you because you're not playing yeah. and you, you have to be really disciplined and, and, and do the right things because mm -hmm. you, you're not playing, yeah. you're not training. So if you don't really, you don't take your diet serious, you yeah. increase weight, yeah. you, you're not going to heal well. So I just, I try to spend as much time with my family and, mm -hmm. and, and stay to people that really love me so so that I get I get like a fresh mind to to get mm. good recovery hmm. I'm sure that you will be going into preseason almost fully healed and with a, a clean page um, for you to start a fresh 2019 coming up and everything um, what are your aspirations and objectives for the upcoming season uh, for me I just have a common goal like just try to have fun because last year I didn't I didn't yeah. have fun and I just I just want to have fun on the field and mm. I know I know if I'm having fun on the field I can do a lot of good stuff mm. so basically I just want to have fun on the field and I know I can good I can do good stuff on the field hmm. now they call Philadelphia the city of brotherly love you you people have a, a Super Bowl championship recently 
Um, what is it like living in the city of Philadelphia and why is it such a big sports hub? I'm, I'm even surprised because Philadelphia is not big. It's, it's small compared yeah. to all the big cities yeah. that have all the club. But I think they have a lot of talent there, mm. like in, in all the major sports. Yeah. They, they have the NBA, they are doing really well. Do, do you ever go to NBA games? Yeah, I've, I've been to games and, yeah. and they are doing really well. Joe Embiid. Or they have like uh, Ben Simmons, Ben Simmons, yeah. Jimmy Butler now, yeah. and they are they are playing well. So it's like the the club, the, the city loves sports, and and they support they support the clubs who they have. So it's they, they show love to to all the clubs in Philly. Mm. I think that that's the main thing that is helping the city grow grow in every aspect of 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 the sports. Mm. Has has your perception about the MLS changed in your time in America? Yeah, yeah. Because when I was in Europe or in Ghana, the the perception is different. Because personally, I, I didn't really think uh, MLS uh, can be compared to some of the leagues in, in yeah. Europe. But I played in Sweden. I played. I'm playing in MLS now, and I think MLS is the quality is higher than in Sweden. Mm. Because and now the league is growing. They have a lot of young players coming in. True. Young good players. South American, everyone is, is coming to MLS, so it's making the league interesting. Hmm. Let's talk about the network of Ghanaian players in the MLS now. Jonathan Mensah, Martin Blessing, um, Harrison. Harrison Afo, a couple of the guys there. Ebenezer Ofori. Ebenezer Ofori. What's, what's the connection like? Are you people really related? Do you people get together, maybe Thanksgiving every now and then? Uh, America is too huge to, to be, <laughs> before you travel, you have to take yeah. like a flight, two, three hours flight, yeah. but we, we, we have in contact, we, we still keep in contact with everyone. Mm. We talk, we talk a lot. I talk to John Harrison most of the time and, and we're still friends, but every time we play, you know, yeah. you know, it's, it's competition. So yeah. it's, it's different story. But after the games, uh, we, we go to dinner, like after the games, because we have, yeah. we have the night off and we go to dinner, we talk. So it's, it's nice to, to have all these mm. Ghanaians coming into the league. You miss the Black Stars? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's, that's every player's dream to, to be playing for, for a national team. Now, these days, football in Ghana has literally come to a halt over corruption and whatnot. We are trying to rework our football. When, when you look at Ghanaian football, what is that one thing that gives you a headache that you wish that when this dust on this normalization committee settles, that problem or that issue possibly would have been taken care of? Uh, I think the, the player's salary, because I, I, feel, I feel really bad. I know some of the players that play in the league and, yeah. and, and their salary is, is not good, personally, because... I don't know because maybe our economy, I don't know, or the clubs don't really have money, but mm -hmm. I think it's something that we need to work hard enough yeah. to, to change because some of them can't, can't even buy boots for themselves. And, 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 and it's, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's really sad watching some of my colleagues struggle like this. Hmm. Now, we talk about the struggle and talk about the player salaries. The committee say that they have just about two <coughs> months to finish their work. Um, I don't know, but have you had any interactions with them? Have they reached out to you as national team players, players who play in the diaspora, try to get maybe some form of ideas, brainstorm with you guys? No, but I think they, they, they were in contact with, with the PFA and all of yeah. us are under PFA. And we, we, gave, we gave some ideas to the PFA yeah. for, uh, because uh, we, we want the Ghana League to, to be better. We want Ghana football to be better. So... We also gave our ideas to the P PFA to, to give to the normalization committee. So hopefully they take into, uh, into consideration yeah. and, and make uh, Ghana football better again. Mm. Now, 2019, of course, is AFCON year. And <coughs> when the AFCON comes around, the question comes around again. We haven't won the AFCON in close to 36 years. It's been that long a time since Ghana last won the AFCON. You look at the playing body now. You look at the management and the direction the team is heading in now. Um, what do you think about it? The new look Black Stars under Kwesi Apia and Coach Tanko. Uh, I think they, they are really good, uh, good coaches and they also 
they have played for the blaster they know mm. african football so yeah. I, I think the national team is in a good hands mm. it's in a good hands and i always say this we we have the talent and we have the team to yeah. to beat anyone in africa we Meaning just, that you are saying that we have the talent to win this cup. Yeah, we have the talent. We have the team to beat anyone in Africa. Mm. But we, we just need to do the right things. We just need to prepare and... and, and Is get it all about preparation, though? I, because I know that in America where you are, teams have access to all the facilities yeah. in the world, but there's still a gulf in quality between the elite teams and the so not good teams. And I said, we have the quality. Yeah. We have the qualities to beat anyone in Africa. Yeah. That, that's for sure. You, I don't think anyone can can challenge that because mm. I know we have the talent, we have the quality, and it, it's not it's not just about preparation. Mm. There's there's a lot to do to to, to win a trophy, and preparation is, is a key part. Yeah. But there, there's also other stuff that we need to do to, to win to win a trophy. Talking about preparation, let me talk about your own preparation for games. Do you have any pre-game routines? Any weird stuff you get into before you? walk onto the pitch to play no i don't i don't i just i just i just want to i just try to have my nine hours uh sleep yeah. uh, like a night before the game yeah. and, and and eat the right food that's basically that's what i do just have a good sleep and also eat the right food that's all hmm. now talking about the afcon and winning the african cup of nations let's let me pick you your, your opinion on individual stuff who's your best african player right now right now <laughs> uh it's tough I, I would say Mohamed salah is it because he's sort of the same structure as you and his game is similar no because of what he's doing because people people underrated him and he yeah. he's had like a major setbacks in his career yeah. but he still kept fighting on and now he's at the top so for me at the moment he's the best african player now Talk about managers who you've played for and perhaps those you look up to. Um, are there any favorites, any managers that you perhaps have marked down as somebody that if you had your own way, you probably would be coached by? Uh, I, was, I would go for Graham Potter because uh, he, he gave me my first professional contract and, yeah. and he taught me a lot. In my short time with him, he taught me so much. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would love to play under him again. Hmm. Now, the EPL is big in Ghana, obviously. Yeah. Um, a bird whispered into my ear that you are an Arsenal fan. Uh, <laughs> how is it going out there? I mean, how, how, how are you taking in the whole new transition of your club? As in Wenger gone, Unai Emery in, what's that like for you? Uh, in, in every transition, it's, it's always difficult. Yeah. This, we're still at the beginning and... And so far, I've seen progress compared to the last two, three years. Yeah. I've seen progress and it's just the beginning. So we should give the management some time. And I know we'll get our old Arsenal back again. When you say the old Arsenal, you mean the ones that used to the, play? The Invincibles, the, the <laughs> ones that won, won the league without losing. And yeah. Those are the times. But I think we, we, we'll get there. We'll get there. Let me pick your thoughts on your possible favorite 11 of all time. If, if we had to do like a matchup 11 where you were picking the players that you wanted, could be retired, could be active, who, who would make that 11? Starting 11. from a goalkeeper. Uh, goalkeeper. Oh, shit. Uh, my, my type of goalkeepers needs to be crazy. They need to be commanding. <laughs> yeah. So I'll go with Oliver Kahn okay. for goalkeeper. And right back, right back, I would say... Uh, who, who? Someone who can defend and also attack. Ooh. Kafu, Brazilian Kafu. Okay. Yeah. And, oh, maybe Alves, Daniel Alves. I don't know, I'll go with Kafu. You go with Kafu? Yeah. Left back, no doubt, Marcelo. Ah. Marcelo is he's on a different class, different level. And the, the center backs, center backs. Uh, center backs. <laughs> Uh, Ramos, okay. Ramos and Ramos and who else? Uh, it's tough. It's tough to. Oh, what what formation are you even playing? 
Four four two four three three four one five. The five should be all attackers. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I need defenders who can defend. Just defend. And you have one more centre back to go. Yeah, yeah, one more. Who else? Who else? Maybe Ferdinand. I'll go with Ferdinand. Ah, that's a nice back line. Ferdinand. Yeah. So you have five midfielders now, or yeah. five attackers, if you five want. Five. No, I, I need like a holding. I'll midfielder. go with Mike Elsian to 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 okay. do the defensive job. Okay. And so I have how many now? Five. Yeah. You have three more midfielders to go, depending on how you look at it. Or no, how I, you just, I just need five. Five, five okay. attackers. So you need, okay. okay. They can. They can. They, they can, can do whatever rotate. they want. They can do whatever <laughs> they want at the top. I'll choose Ronaldinho. Okay. Uh, Brazilian Ronaldo. Okay. And Cristiano Ronaldo. Okay. Messi. Four. That's four. four. Yeah, one more. And Thierry Henry. That's it. Mm. Interesting stuff. There. That's a very <laughs> that's a very loaded loaded. That's line. it. We have Michael Sian and, and the centre backs. They will do their job. The the five can stay up there and enjoy themselves. Amazingly <laughs> attack minded. Is, is that what you're going to do if you're a coach? Gang ho, you are you are an attack minded person. I am. I'll just attack. I will I'm at, I love to attack, and hmm. I have I, I do have problem with coaches. They they want me to defend, defend. But <laughs> it's part, I have to defend, but yeah. you know my strength is attacking, and mm. I just have to focus on my strength. Let's 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 just direct the conversation into the changing faces of the modern game of football. Now, like you're saying, you don't necessarily like being told by coaches to track back and defend. How how, how is it for players who have a lot of attacking talent? Like yourself, in recent times, we've seen a guy like Paul Pogba butt heads with his coach because Rashford. he's not liked the approach of attack and defend at the same time. What is a player's mentality when they know that their strengths lay in the attacking side of the pitch, but they are being asked by a manager to do a defensive job? How does a player take that type of instruction? It, it's not easy for an attacking manager player, but in this modern game, you, you have to do both. Mm. Even even if it's not your strength, at least you should try and do it. Mm. And but also now most coaches have like they build a team around the attacking players, and they have like people who do their job for yeah. for the attack for attackers. They they allow them freedom to go forward, and they have like midfielders who defend for them. So it's it's difficult though. It depends on on how you want to play and the type mm. of coaches that that is available. You're still watching the tracker here on City TV. We are in the home of Philadelphia Union and Ghana forward David Akam. He's been walking us through what his career has been like, where he started out from, what the most challenging points of his career have been like. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. news checks as they unfold 2020 news all day all the time politics sports entertainment business and more and that's all for 2020 news on city tv all the news in 20 minutes news analysis projections and policies that affect your business curated and delivered in a simple and timely format watch business dashboard your most comprehensive source of business news every weekday at 7 p.m only on city tv
spend 30 minutes every weekday catching up with all the trending social media conversations of the day. If you tweet it, we'll read it. We might just even Skype you. 30 minutes is all it takes, so use the hashtag 30minutes on social media to catch our attention. Join the most interactive social media TV show weekdays at 5 p.m. only on City TV. Welcome back to the tracker here on City TV. David, we're talking about the changing faces of the game and how the modern day footballer adapts to uh, the game. Now, Luka Modric defied the odds by becoming Ballon d'Or winner, trumping Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. One of my colleagues at work does not seem to understand how, in the name of football, that should happen. What, what did you think about the decision by the representatives who voted to make Modric? A standout player over Ronaldo and Messi. Uh, I, I think he did. He did really well in the yeah. year of review. He uh, he won the Champions League. Yeah. He he helped Croatia to to the final of the yeah. uh, World Cup. So yeah. personally, he he did well. And whether he deserved it, I, I don't really know. But he did really well. And and the two closest to him, I don't think they they achieve so much compared to what he yeah. did that year so uh you can't you can't really begrudge him winning winning the the ballon d'or i have become of the opinion that these days to win the ballon d'or you need to score a lot of goals so now the brains of guys like modric and perhaps even if they were playing now guys like zinedine zidane would have been hard for them to win the ballon d'or don't you think that's unfair that we judge who wins the best player in the world based on goals and we ignore the craft of thinkers like that? Yeah, at first, I think it's, it's unfair because we, we also have to reward the other aspects of the yeah. game that are really important, like defending. Yeah. Defending is, is, is a skill and not many people can do that. So we, we need to reward other, other players as well, like people who can defend well and but now all, people only look at scoring goals yeah. and it's not fair to other players like uh, the defenders and also the midfielders. So I don't know whether it will change or not, but we, we need to start looking at other skills yeah. of, of the game as well. Now let's talk about your other <coughs> life. You, you spoke about it in the beginning, about you being involved in the sports medicine aspect of the game. Um, how did you bump into that and how has that developed into such a key component of your life as a footballer? Uh, I, I did sports science and... That's back in the university at England? Yeah, yeah. I, I did sports science and you, you learn so much uh, about how your body works and all the stuff that you put in your body. So mm. as, as a footballer, it was easy. I don't need uh, my nutritionist or... Yeah. Uh, someone to tell me that I need to do the right things to, to succeed as a, as a footballer. So, uh, and, and in this part of the world, we don't, we don't really take uh, certain serious because yeah. one, we don't have enough money to, to, to uh, employ all these sure. people, sure. these specialists, so it's, it's difficult. I mean, um, how, how far are you willing to take that sports science business? Is this something that you're going to engage full-time when you retire or you already started even maybe doing some active stuff with it right now? Uh, yeah, I, I love sports and, and 
and I love to, to do like sports, uh, uh, sports science. So my, my plan is always to get involved yeah. uh, in helping other people understand their, their body, uh, their, how, how the body system works and mm -hmm. how effective uh, the body will be if, we, if they are doing the right things with nutrition and also uh, how they manage their body. So uh, for sure, after my career, I, I think I, that's what I'll be doing to, to help uh, athletes. Hmm. Talking about helping athletes, um, you managed to go back to your roots, the Sakomono School Complex Park. Uh, just about, what, a few days ago, you hosted some sort of gala out there. What was the thinking behind that whole um, gala tournament that you organized? Uh, I, I, love, I love giving back to, to the community that made me who I am now. And, and, and that's, that's the main reason why I joined Common Go, to, yeah. to, to, uh, uh, to help stop some, some of the major problems in the world, like yeah. poverty, uh, uh, inequalities, and, and try to help uh, kids get quality education. So yeah. when I came back, I thought, it's, it's a good way to, mm -hmm. to bring some of my colleagues, mm -hmm. footballers, to, yeah. to come to the community, organize some, some tournaments for them to, to see all these guys, because some of them watch them on TV only. So yeah. it was nice to bring them here to, uh, for, for the fans to, to see them personally and close. So it, it's just a way of giving back, back to them. Mm. Is it something that was one of, or is, I mean, have you been motivated by the first time to perhaps do it again? Yeah, yeah, I, I was really motivated by, yeah. by the reception I got because it went really well. The, uh, the fans came, came there, yeah. uh, some of the guys who came to, to play. So I think it's, it's something that I, I want to, to continue doing in the future. Hmm. Now, away from your life in football, I see that you were watching football when we came in. I see your FIFA 19 CDJ uh, just nestling on your stand over there. How, how much of a gamer are you when you are not kicking the ball yourself? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we do to pass time. Because after training, yeah. uh, you do, when you don't have like class or you don't have yeah. anything, you, you just home playing, playing mm. FIFA, playing other games. When you say class, friends. what do you mean? You have classes like within your playing? Yeah, yeah, because some, some, some of my players or some of us yeah. take like uh, taking classes like wow. we have like uh we do online classes and stuff so if wow. you not have if you're not doing it then you're just free so you can are you play. are you are you really good at fifa i'm okay i'm okay <laughs> I, <laughs> when, you say, when you say you're okay what do you I'm mean okay. on, the, on a scale of one to ten i would say uh seven seven i'm okay that I'm, sounds pretty good yeah I, i'm not too good but I'm, <laughs> i have some friends who are really really good and ah. they are really, some, some of them are really good because maybe they play too much interesting now is that your only outside the game hobby or you have other hobbies that we don't know about no nah, I, I love to read as well so mm. uh, at the moment just reading and playing games because i don't have any you read novels or politics history anything anything uh, yeah because I, I'm, I'm interested in current affairs so mm. uh, i read politics as well i, I don't know i don't i don't think i'll, I'll end up in po politics but I, I love current affairs. I know everything happening in Ghana, everything in the world. So I, I just, I just want, want to broaden my, my, my mind. Hmm. Let's, let's talk a bit about social media because you say you like to read. Now, how, how has social media changed football? Because these days, there are times where players lose matches and they are posting pictures on social media or they are commenting about stuff and managers don't seem to be too happy. How... Do you yourself relate with your Instagram followers, Twitter followers, without, I mean, crossing the team line on certain occasions? Uh, I think now technology is taking over everything, yeah. and and players make make money out of social media, yeah. and and also <laughs> social media can make and also break you. Yeah. So, like we have we, we have like uh, the club have people that come come to the club, they talk to us about yeah. social media, yeah. uh, things we should post and things we shouldn't. Yeah. And we're always careful, but also that, that's where some people, some of us make money because yeah. you have marketing deals and all this stuff that you post. Yeah. But you, you, need, you need to know that the right time 
and mm. also has, has social media ever gotten you in trouble before uh yeah yeah <laughs> what were you after i don't know i was i think i was i was home with friends yeah like a little bit of having fun but it was a wrong time though because we, we lost a game we were not playing well and yeah you see fans watching your social media oh, you, so you you were having fun with your friends yeah. fans, fans don't understand, understand why you should be having fun when you're <laughs> when losing, you're losing game. games but you understand that because they pay money to watch games and they, they love the club so you need to know the right the right time to be posting stuff hmm. i mean to round off the conversation um where do you see Ghanaian football going in the next five years based on the interactions you've had with Colts players, your own professional players, coaches, where should our football rightfully or realistically be in the next five years? Uh, at the moment, I think we, we should take it one at a time because yeah. we, we had a difficult period in the yeah. last year and everything that came out. So yeah. uh, I think the normalization committee are doing well at the moment so we should support them yeah. and but also they, they should try and uh, involve all the stakeholders in the game because mm. the stakeholders uh put their money and also put their effort in everything so talking about not to catch you talking about stakeholders putting their money and effort i don't know if you watched a little bit of the women's under 17 world cup and then also um the black queens they didn't do too well but if you had any words for our women's uh, football footballers generally and our women's game what would it be uh i think that, that's where the inequality is coming we, yeah. the effort we put in women football is, is not good enough yeah and compared to the men men football and we, we need to start doing better and and i think with this tournament and what what happened we will learn from this now during the women's under 17 world cup in uruguay and also the women's African game in Ghana, I had a lot of comments that really had me disturbed. I sort of feel as if a lot of individuals think that the women's football is still for leisure and that there's still nothing really serious about women's football. It's a mentality shift what we need to get women's football to succeed. We, we have a lot of work to do and uh, me mentally we, it's all about men for us but some of us like not, most of us need to change our mentality. Yeah. We, we need to start looking at women football as, as the same as the men. Because yeah. what, when you go to other countries, they take women serious, uh, women football serious, and they they are having the the profits and they are yeah. enjoying the success. So that's what we need to do. But at the moment, we're not doing enough, and, yeah. and that that needs to change. Hmm. Nice one there. Nice one there. So that's. You are number seven. Yeah. Oh, you won number 11 in Chicago. In Chicago. And I wanted 11, but I couldn't, so I have to. Ah. Seven. <laughs> but seven is a lucky number, though. Nah, but I don't really like you seven. You don't like seven? I, I prefer double numbers. Oh, really? So, I prefer double numbers. So you, so you just picked this randomly? Yeah, because that's the only available one for me, so I chose it. Interesting. Wow. How come nobody wanted number seven? Number seven is such a prestigious number. You know, but not every player wants, wants to be in the spotlight with that number. Mm. So. Interesting there. So, where, where are we going to sign this? I think the back will, will be okay. Yeah, Any, okay. anywhere nice. Yeah. Yes. I still have my number 11 as my initials. Nice one there. So, hmm, interesting there. So, David, I come off Philadelphia Union there. I get my jersey officially signed. Yes, looking real good there, number seven. He says that he doesn't really like number seven, but <laughs> I don't really mind. It's a, it's a nice jersey anyway. David, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank well, it's been amazing spending time with the man inside his abode. He's giving us a jersey. He's giving us what his career path has looked like. We really can't ask for more here on the tracker. But you know what? Like I always tell you, you never know where our lenses will turn up. Keep watching the tracker on City TV.
This is the point of view. We are live on City TV this and every Monday and Wednesday at 9 p.m. Tune in to the point of view Mondays and Wednesdays at 9 p.m. as Bernard Avlet takes the news further. He will bring the right guests, ask them the relevant questions, and get you the real insights you need on the big stories for the day. All that the 